all over the yard. For being a wise people who do it in a friendly way. I want no, I think it is. I will like Well, we have lots of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's the only one. Huh? Heidi, Heidi, Heidi. I, I have a strange request from a citizen who I was down at the house and I got this evening. Want to talk to me? Maybe we got to be Good evening, it's 7 o'clock. Welcome to the uh, April 3rd uh, Council Committee meeting. Um, first up, Committee of the Whole. Uh, we're going to do boards and commission interview. Keep in mind that this appointment is to fill an unexpired term that ends on 12-31-24. So, Amy, you want to start calling people? Yep. We'd ask you to come up to the podium and sure. give your name and address and kind of why you want to be on this <coughs> committee. And maybe or maybe not, we'll ask questions. But thank you for applying. Crystal Foster. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Crystal Foster, my address is 450 Silver Meadows Boulevard. Um, have been a uh, long time, lifetime resident of Kent. Went to uh, Franklin, Davy, Roosevelt, and then graduated from Kent State. Um, currently work at First Energy in substation compliance with federal and state compliance. Um, and I have been interested in getting, uh, you know, more involved with local government, see how everything works, and that sort of thing. So, um, Kent Park and Rec just honestly sounded like the funnest, funnest one. <laughs> <laughs> Where's I Angela? Yeah, yeah. Hey Angela, quit cheering back there, right? <laughs> I um, honest, and I also have some I ideas that I'd like to maybe share, um, and have been researching grant opportunities for those ideas. Um, but also, um, if there were other positions on other boards, because I know there's quite a few applicants for the for the Kent Park and Rec, um, if there were other boards that did not have applicants, I'd be interested in those as well. Keep, keep the clerk's phone number available. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> we do have different openings. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, are there questions? Yeah. Mr. Sedoti. Yeah, but first of all, what would be some other board you'd be interested in? Uh, maybe the housing board, uh -huh. the fair housing board, or, um, you know, I, honestly, I don't remember the other ones. Uh, that's okay. I was actually that's deciding between Kent Park and Rec and housing, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, as far as Kent Parks and Rec, mm -hmm. all right, what, what, what would you see or some of the things that you would like to see? What are they doing well? What are some of the things you might want to be part of if you were on the board in terms of beginning to look at how we might be able to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. even uh, take a good program and even make it better. What would sure. Um, so I think that we have really good sports for like youth. Youth sports is really great. Um, I think we also have a really great program for the adult, um, like the adult softball program is really good. I just went to the fundraiser for the old timers league last week. You looked at me when you said old timers. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Look at him. I, 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 I. <laughs> well, they were like, my husband came with me and they were like, oh, are you a player? And he said, no. And they said, well, do you want to be? Yeah. And <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I think that they're, they're doing really great with those. But I do think that we could have some more things for, you know, um, places for kids to go in the summertime as far as maybe splash pads or, um, mm -hmm. splash you, pad know, would be nice. you know, school, or mm -hmm. not school, but um, public, maybe a public pool and a splash pad would be like, you know, if we couldn't afford a public pool, maybe a some pool. splash pad somewhere. <laughs> um, I also think that there's a good opportunity for improvement on the boat launch at Middlebury Road. Mm -hmm. um, right now it's kind of in the street and there's no parking there. Um, and there's a really old dilapidated building over on the right hand side that maybe could be purchased and prettied up and turned into parking. Um, so something like that. Um, those are my two main ideas. Also maybe like a parks passport for just Kent. I know there's one for Portage, but maybe for Kent we could do something like that. Um, okay, well thank just you. Just to get you're them more involved. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is that it, Roger? Yeah. Heidi? Yeah, did you participate in the survey that the Parks Board put out about a year or so ago? I did, and I shared it on my Facebook, and I tried to get people <laughs> to, to also, um, you know, vote in that. Um, I, w I'm, I don't think I ever saw any results from it, though. Yeah, I, I, I don't, don't think, think we I did either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's coming. Okay. Okay, and then I also shared, actually, there's a job fair that's going on. I also just shared that on my Facebook the other day. Yeah, <coughs> Thank you. Any others? Gwen? Yeah, I just have a quick question. So in just looking over your resume here as um, business analyst, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it looks like you've got a lot of business analyst experience. Yeah. Is there any particular experience that you have that you think would relate directly to Parks and Rec that you think we ought to know about? Or like, um, you know, experience like, like on a board, or something that, you know, kind of fits in with what Parks and Rec does that maybe was a component of what you currently do or have done? Well, I, I guess I would say more on the business side of that. I'm very um, process driven um, because I'm an analyst. I like to figure things out. <laughs> um, so if there's something that, number one, I've never done, I'm going to figure out how to do it. Number two, um, if there's a breakdown in process as far as like, you know, I'm going to analyze that and figure it out and fix it. 
Um, so that, that is my job. That's what I do at my job, <laughs> process improvement. So um, that sort of thing as far as like, you know, also mm -hmm. implementing software has been part of my, my job and, you know, that sort of thing. So if, if there were any type of software and, you know, the website and that sort of thing, testing and all that kind of stuff, I would also have experience in that type of thing. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Turner? Yeah, uh, Crystal, how, <coughs> being that you are a daughter of Kent, mm -hmm. um, how do you feel your background and understanding of the community uh, would give you some type of advantage or knowledge hitting the ground on where you would like to see the uh, the Parks and Rec Board start moving and mm -hmm. have you been in touch with any of the uh, <coughs> administrators? So, so I didn't have an opportunity. I did want to reach out to Angela and talk about what their goals were for the year, but I didn't have an opportunity to get that to that today. It's been a crazy week for work-wise. Um, however, um, I do have a lot of community um, I mean, I've been here for 40 years, 46 years. It's hard not to know people. <laughs> so there are a lot of people, you know, involved in Park and Rec as far as like, you know, Marcus and Marcus Wright and a couple other people who are on the um, football <coughs> board and that sort of thing that um, <coughs> I've grown up with, been very involved with and, and um, are actually part of my extended family. Um, my brother-in-law works here in the fire department um, and, you know, um, so I definitely have a lot of connection to the community <laughs> and um, have seen kind of how Kent, ha Kent Park and Rec has grown and um, really enjoy a lot of their programs that, you know, my, my daughter, I put my daughter in a lot of the programs growing up. She's now getting ready to have her first child, so we will definitely also be coming through the programs with grandchildren so <laughs> um, I definitely have um, lots of experience here in Kent so thank you hope that answered the question sure. no, thank you all right thank you, thank thank you. you Crystal thank you. <coughs> next well, the next applicant, Sherry Jeffers, um, is out ill tonight, so she will not be here. Uh, so the next person on the list is Chelsea Treveline. Same thing. Give us a little reason why and your name, and all, and we'll might ask questions. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chelsea Treveline. Uh, I am at 953 Malloy Road, so just up from the Kent Bog. I am unfortunately not a lifetime Kent resident. Hard to compete with that. I am new to Kent, uh, the Kent area. My, I moved here because um, my husband is a new faculty member at Kent State. Um, I work remotely. I work for a small woman's owned business in B Corps uh, called Making Sense International. So I work from home. Uh, I'm a researcher by training in social science. So I do a lot of work in particular in, in the international development space. Um, so working on youth development, gender equity, um, social inclusion um, in various low and middle income countries all around the world. So I am our methods person. I do focus groups, interviews, surveys, um, and really um, provide support also. My, my training is in public health. Um, so sort of very broadly thinking about the systems that impact the health across those different sectors that I work in. Um, I was particularly interested in the Parks and Rec Board because I have a philosophy of a what we call One Health philosophy. So I think about our natural, our built environment as impacting our health, not just um, you know our physical health, but also our mental, emotional, spiritual health. So um, as somebody who always works from home and can't wait to get outside at the end of my workday, I feel most connected to my community through natural spaces. So um, was really interested, in particular, in the Parks and Rec Board um, for that reason. Um, <laughs> I also do a lot of I've done work um, before my current job. I am originally from Don't Pittsburgh. Right, so I'm a, I'm a yinzer, um, so I'm from about two hours away. Um, and if you're familiar you with that right. term, I hear some laughs. Okay. And there, when I lived in, when I was a city of Pittsburgh resident, I served on our gender equity commission, so I do have some experience working on city boards. Um, 
for, for my, some other uh, points I might briefly mention, um, before turning it back to you all, um, for that um, position and for my, my current work, I per, um, participate in business development. So for my um, position on the board, I oversaw an RFP proposal process, so I helped design and oversee that, but also <coughs> evaluated. Um, so I'm very familiar with various project management skills. Uh, I can develop Gantt charts. Uh, I've done work planning um, and various kind of like technical um, activities in that space. Um, I also, for my current job, serve on our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. So, and I think of our parks as a key area where we can promote accessibility of various Kent residents, including students um, that are here at Kent State. Um, and then I also serve on our environmental advisory team. So, from my, my research hat, excuse me, um, I also help. Um, sort of measure the um, environmental impact of my company, which is a B Corp. So we're very focused on the impact of our activities on the environment around us <coughs> um, to try to understand the impact of our work and how we can um, try to mitigate that with our own actions as well. So maybe I'll just leave it at that, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions? Mr. Sedona? Yeah, I'll ask the same question. Uh, <coughs> what are some of the areas or focus that you would bring to the uh, you know, on to the committee that uh, would, what, what would you focus on in terms of improvement, building upon the good things that we're already doing? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where, would, where would you see yourself fitting in that? So in terms of my skill sets I can offer, again, I'm a researcher by training, so I'm always thinking about how we can gather as much information as we can to, you know, uh, better understand our situation and how we can improve things. Um, so that could look a number of different ways. It could be some... Uh, community surveys, listening sessions, focus groups, so trying to better understand the community's perspective on Parks and Rec, you know, what are some ways we can raise awareness about our program, further engage Kent's residents, so I'm always thinking about how like, we can gather information, um, and I've, I've done that in a community setting, including when I was on our Gender Equity Commission in Pittsburgh, so um, always happy to think of opportunities to collect information and also information that we feel like we can actually use and act on to further any of our goals. Um, Again, I have a lot of project management skills, so overseeing and developing budgets, um, coming up with timelines, um, work on very, um, uh, working also with other boards. I also um, do a lot of work in sort of the ethical and research space, so also thinking about the impact of our, our actions on various populations. Um, so those are some skills that I think that I bring, and again, really, I think <coughs> diversity and equity and accessibility are really important to me, so really thinking about are there ways that we can, um, you know, think about the diverse residents of Kent and further promote engagement in parks and rec programs. Like, what are some things we can think about? Can we gather some more information um, to be more inclusive in our approaches? So uh, those are some initial thoughts. I also have some ideas I'm happy to share as well, but those are some skills that I could see being potentially helpful. Anybody else? Chris? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, as someone who has, you know, who also has one foot, <coughs> I work remotely also, um, as someone who also has sort of one foot outside of Kent, um, I'm curious, after six months, what do you think? How's Kent been? And I see someone with your skill set really helping, you know, not just in this position, but the wider work of capturing perspectives that don't get that don't get captured. I see that as a skill set in your in your C V. So I guess that's a two part question is what do you think of Kent and what do you, how do you see kind of your contribution to the community blossoming either in this role or just what's a philosophy that you're bringing to this? Absolutely. So I will admit I'm a first time home buyer and owner, so have been sucked into that process a bit in the past <laughs> six months and have not gone to explore as much of like I think I've got a lot more takeout than visited restaurants if I'm being completely honest with you all as we've had various home improvement projects already ongoing. Um, but I, I've really enjoyed it. I love being in a college community. I do a lot of work in youth development, so I thought was one of the reasons that really excited me to the various commissions in Kent is the opportunity to really leverage um, the wonderful resource that is Kent State and really thinking about partnerships. Mm -hmm. So that's like where a lot of my ideas are just to, to you know, give you a, uh, a sneak peek. Um, I love that there there are various, like I said, I'm right up from the Kent blog, so I love that there are, you know, natural spaces that I can explore. That's really important to me, again, after 
you know, sitting <laughs> all in a very sedentary position since I work remotely. Um, so having the opportunity to get outside as soon as I can is something I really appreciate. Um, and yeah, I've been able to kind of connect with, with local folks at Kent State, which has been a great you know, opportunity. Again, I see a lot of opportunities there. Um, but I feel like in the six months in here, I've not really been able to full explore. I'm, I'm excited now that it's finally, hopefully, reliably going to be warm to actually get to know the community a little bit better. So um, I feel like that, that's, that's you know, certainly my, my goal for the upcoming months in the summer. Um, and then your second question, if you could just repeat it, like rephrase <laughs> just to make sure I, I catch yeah, it. Yeah, that would probably be good. Um, I don't think I said it very well. <laughs> just, um, you know, if not, if not this position. <laughs> If not this position, um, I'm curious, um, would you be interested in serving at other boards, commissions? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think similar to Crystal, I, I, I think, I hope that I think some of the skills that I could bring, um, you know, could be helpful to other boards. Um, so would love to get involved um, and get more connected to the community. So. Um, Again, I think I can bring perspective from the environmental side, um, the diversity and equity side. Um, I also have a lot of experience uh, writing grants, and again, from on both sides of the grant proposal review application review process. So um, I support business development for my company, and again, for my work on the, the equity commission, had have done so. So um, I feel confident that I could help support, um, you know, pursuing funding opportunities. I know that um, Kent State, for example, has an environmental research initiative where they have grants of up to 20 grand, I've heard. So um, thinking about the work that we might want to further through Parks and Rec or other boards, I see opportunities there where I would be more than willing to provide support in you know, securing funding um, to support other initiatives. Um, and maybe more broadly, I see not just for the Parks and Rec board, but for other commissions, uh, again, I think that there are so many opportunities that are uh, we could consider with, with Kent State being here. So I do a lot of work with youth development, and a big part of my work is um, letting youth lead. So really training youth, providing support, but also um, letting them sort of step into the driver's seat. And so I think about Kent State, and I think about, um, again, my research hat is on. So are there certain research questions? Are there certain things we want to know about our parks? Are there certain things we want to know about housing? Um, here in Kent that could be a great research project for a student that needs to do a project, wants to do an internship. Um, they get a valuable learning opportunity, something they can add on their resume um, that can propel them for further workforce opportunities. And then we can learn something and it's a bi-directional relationship. So that's just, you know, one example but something I've been thinking about and as someone who, before I, I left academia and, and went over to um, sort of more the, um, the, the profit sector, um, you know, I advise students, I continue to work with you so I could see myself <coughs> acting as a liaison if that was something that was of interest. Like really, you know, what are the different um, councils, committees, uh, student groups that can that align with the various commissions and boards of, of the city of Kent? Can we connect with them? Are there, again, opportunities where some of them want to be in local government in the future? Um, where again, we can, we can connect with them and create a learning opportunity for them, but we can also make and have a very important, valuable youth perspective. And so also I think having youth perspective on any of our boards is also really valuable, including from our local youth residents. So those are just some ideas floating around in my head, but I think, again, that could be explored through Parks and Rec or, or other boards that are looking for some more support. Further? Thank you for applying. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you Next. <coughs> Jillian Tipton. A little something, the reason why. <laughs> Hi. My name is Jillian Tipton. I live at 447 Park Avenue, um, and I applied for this position because uh, I'm not sure if you saw from my resume, but this is my jam. I am all about outdoor education. <laughs> So currently I'm the executive director for two nonprofits in Akron, um, and I, I really love that role. It's a great way for me to work with boards of directors and to really support them to making financially sound decisions in order to support both the missions and visions of both organizations. <coughs> but prior to that, I had worked for both Girl Scouts of Northeast Ohio and the YMCA of Delaware, um, offering outdoor programming not only for youth, but also for adults. 
resident camp outdoor programming for the summer, whether they're one-hit wonders um, like 5Ks or things like that, um, and then uh, day camp, which are all things that Kent Parks and Rec does. In addition to that, I also trained um, volunteers to then turn around and offer those programs to kids, whether it's a high ropes course or whitewater rafting. Um, that was part of my responsibility. Um, and so really having that type of background, I feel, provides me with a unique opportunity and experience to join this position on this board of directors. Um, I can give back to Kent in many ways, and I do. I'm a member of the JCs. I volunteer with Main Street Kent. I like to give the bars and restaurants a lot of my money. Probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a way that I think that I can go ahead and really use some of my skills that I'm not currently using right now. I love my job in Akron, but really Parks and Rec and that outdoor education and reaching the whole child and making sure that our community has access to those outdoor resources is what I'm all about. Mm. Questions? Roger. Well, I'll go back to my original question. So let's set your jam aside for a yeah. minute and think a little bit about y being a board member <laughs> and the responsibilities of a board member. What are some of the areas that you would like to see maybe the park build upon and park and recs build upon? Um, what are some of the areas that uh, you think your strengths could help in that process? Yeah. So throughout Northeast Ohio, throughout the world, everywhere. There is staffing problems, and I think that in staffing world, especially as we come up to summer camps and summer programming, that is the time when it's really imperative for us to focus on bringing in some of those good folks to turn around and work with the students. When I was reading, or the campers, um, or part the program participants, uh, when I was reading back through some of the meeting minutes from your previous meetings, I read a couple times that there's problems with staffing issues, and that is something that I think really needs to be focused on. Sometimes you gotta spend the money to make the money, and you gotta bring in those really good staff. And so working with Kent State University, working with other community partners to bring in those staff, not only locally, but also from the community around us, I mm -hmm. think would be a good way to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions? Anybody? Heidi? Are there any other boards or commissions that you feel that you would be able to put your talents in? I see that you're an architect. <coughs> Oh, we goodness. do have no. a planning commission. <laughs> uh, uh, my sister-in-law is an architect. I heard cats for architecture, so I'm not an architect. You're not. No. <laughs> I just work with them. I don't have your <laughs> resume, I guess. I just have an application. She's got jam and she hurts cats. I see. So I well, you're, you're affiliated with architects. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, so so oh. there's not really. Um, your, this is really your jam. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, Tim Wonderly. A little bit reason why. <laughs> <laughs> A familiar face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim Wonderly, 420 Bowman Drive. Third generation Kentite, worked with and for Parks and Rec for 30 years. Uh, so obviously I have some interest. I didn't get burned out yet. Uh, uh, I think I can help. Uh, I just don't want to show up and think I can do something. I'm pretty sure I can. Is that it, Tim? Okay. I can keep I can keep going if you want. Well, no, I, you, <laughs> you're here to impress us, like the rest of us, <laughs> before we try to impress you with the questions that we think we have. <laughs> well, Tim, you've heard the same question from me. You, you know, from your perspective, what what can you bring to help build the program and and those areas you think we need to build? Oh, when I first started 50 years ago, it was basically a recreation that was created by. Uh, Kramer and the boys, a recreation department, and then a subset of parks. And in that 50 years, it has become a parks subset recreation. I don't think we've paid enough attention to recreation. I'd love you guys to come up with some money <coughs> and buy something. They need facilities badly. Uh, the church across from the bowling alley, uh, the North Water Street uh, horning area, you could you could turn this into a peninsula, a bike community, very easily if you could connect Daisy Tree and the old Oak Knolls to, uh, to the Hudson Road. 
uh, people could bike to Cleveland. I think, I think there's a future uh, diamonds in the rough here. Uh, they need facilities. They need money. Uh, I can't give them more than a $20 bill. I don't think, but, uh, you guys, uh, I would like to see, I would like to push for recreation to at least become an equal partner to parks. And uh, so that's what I would okay. be pushing. Thank you. Further questions? Well, you got off easy, I guess. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Okay. Next is Callie Mitchell. A little something. Why? <laughs> okay. So, my name's Callie Mitchell, uh, three eighteen Elmwood. Um, I have kind of been a Kent lifer. We got here, um, my mom we came for the academia when I was five, stayed for the community. Um, so I spent five years in Hudson um, and just moved back almost a year ago-ish uh, and bought the house on Elmwood. Um, I have had an interesting path through life. Um, so I um, originally worked in animal hospitals and have a degree, most of a degree in biology, like a class short. Um, have a degree in organizational communication and then I went back for my master's in speech <coughs> language pathology. And so um, I have opened up a clinic here in Kent, um, I guess technically Franklin Township, um, but we're going to call it Kent. Um, and my specialty is working with kiddos. Um, and so I think Parks and Rec gives me a unique opportunity to further support families and kids in this community. And it's something that is extremely near and dear to me. So not only do I have the natural background, I love this town aggressively. <laughs> um, and. I am <laughs> all about working with kids and supporting families, um, and I also have this um, crazy small business background. Very good. Questions? Ask a question this time. <laughs> okay. Roger. <laughs> yeah, I see it. No, 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 you've heard the question. You know. You want me to just go and save you? Yeah, that? go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I think there's so many opportunities for families I I through Parks and Rec. And for kids, um, I think what a piece that is missing is supporting kids with disabilities, whether they be physical disabilities, communication disabilities, things like that. Um, I spend my entire day with families, um, and this is a piece that they are desperate for. Desperate for. Um, and I think that that could be something, because of my experience, that I can help with. Further questions? Heidi? Um, do any of the other boards or commissions sound interesting to you or would you would you consider serving on something else if you didn't get picked for Parks and Rec this time? Yeah, I mean I'd definitely be interested in having the conversation for sure. I, I liked I I really I wrote your quote down. I love this town aggressively. Oh, so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a new slogan. Yeah, <laughs> I spend a lot of my time here, so you know. <laughs> thank you. Further thank questions? You no, thank you. All right, thank you. Next. Chris Sifrit. A little reason why. Uh, Chris Sifrit, 1053 Kevin Drive. I've hmm. uh, been a resident for 28 years at that residence. Um, I am a maintenance facilities manager at Solon City School District. I work directly with the Parks and Rec Department over at Solon, uh, the city of Solon. So we're always sharing each other's tools for the, uh, for the kids. Um, over a decade I've been in the school district either at Solon or prior to that I was at Crestwood. I'm a graduate of Crestwood, um, graduate of Temple University, BA mm -hmm. in um, business management from Temple and attended Hiram as well. Um, I 
think the, the main reason I looked at this two days ago, <laughs> so I'm the latecomer, <laughs> that's probably why I'm last on the list. Two days ago, I started thinking about how much time my daughter um, and my wife, who is a graduate of Kent, as well as most of my family, my brother-in-law, um, Mike Lewis from Hometown Bank, and, oh, yeah. uh, and, you know, a lot of people that I know and have dinner with in the, uh, in the community, we were walking down the path one day, and they said, "Hey, why why don't you run for one of the one of the board members positions?" And I said, "You know, I feel that when I walk down some of these areas, and when some we we bike at least three times a week down down the bike path. So I'm thinking in a facility management. Oh. <laughs> I'm thinking about in a facilities management <coughs> type of role of how do you." do some preventative maintenance here. How do, we, how do we fix these and maintain what we currently have? Because we have a great infrastructure, I believe, um, to some of it. And then I thought the same way, I mean, you've got a great pool of people here, you gotta admit. Um, I think the same way when it comes to some of these bike paths. I'm talking to uh, Kurt Rur, who I went to school with and graduated, who is a member of, uh, the board member on Portage County Trails. We talked about that same type of path, is how do we connect some of these pathways and what do we do also with that. Before I was working at uh, the school district, I worked for Laurel Lake Retirement Community. And at Laurel Lake, as a facility manager, we built paths in the, in the back of their uh, par three golf course, uh, hold special events, Easter egg hunts, the, you know, the same type of things that a lot of communities are doing. So it, the experience of event organization is a passion of mine, is, is you know, keeping these, these things alive for the kids and also for the adults, and uh, I, I just—it was one thing that just came to my mind two days ago. I said, oh, uh, "You know, yeah, I will do that." So <laughs> I reached—I reached out to a couple of those people that I know, and Mark Bankhauser, and he's like, "Yeah, you should, they need—they need somebody on the board like that." And so I, I just appreciate you uh, considering. Okay, Roger's got a question. For you. <laughs> no, I was going to ask, gonna ask <laughs> him first. You're going to ask me, right? <laughs> No, I guess, you know, you, you've had a lot of different, you've had experiences directly related to parks and recreation. Absolutely. So the, I guess the question, I have to massage it just a bit, but, you know, you've also lived here in Kent. You you know our community. What would you bring to the board that are areas that you would like to see, you know, specifically to build upon? Yeah. I, I mean, you've, con you've talk, you talked a little bit about the trails and those things, but... Right. Is there anything else? I know it's only been two days, but... <laughs> yeah, oh, well, I think it's just stretching out to those, reaching out a little bit farther, a little broader aspect of what I see other communities do, and... and, mm -hmm. and, I, and you I, have some examples of that? Just well, I bring that with, you know, just talking, I go back to biking, I know, just because being at the safety committee for, uh, for the city of Solon, and talking with Mayor Krause, and he's on a bike, and we're talking about bike paths and transforming some of those railroads, old railroads in Solon, it's just it, I'm getting more and more into the passion of, you know, now my daughter's graduate. She's a graduate two, uh, 2022 from, from Kent Roosevelt, and we're almost the empty nester. So my wife and I get a little itchy to do more volunteer work and get out there more. So I think it's just the eye of being a facility manager that I see things, and I see, I see things that need to be upkept. So <coughs> I'm not always worried about what you can do to grow. I'm worried about what it looks like now in some of those areas, and mm -hmm. some of those, some of these trails, some of these lakes, some of the uh, the environment that we currently have, because mm -hmm. we I think we have good structure, but how do we upkeep it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Further questions? I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Mm, thank you thank very you. much. Thank Heidi? you. No, nothing. <laughs> I may be interested in other ones. You never know. Well, I was going to ask you that too. <laughs> Sounded like you were so passionate about the trails. Yeah. I, didn't even I, am, I, am. I mean, you were very specific about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me say this. Uh, like I said at the opening, this is an unexpired term that will be up at 1231 24. Uh, you can reapply again if you aren't successful. Uh, we will vote on the 17th, our meeting, council meeting on the 17th to, to narrow it down to that one person to fill that unexpired term. Second of all, I want to thank you all for applying. Uh, this board really appreciates the volunteer that people give to this city because you're part of the foundation that makes this city so, how great it is. So thank you. Yes. Mr. 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 Mayor? Mr. Mayor. Do you know when... Our another board position will be up at 
at parks? The 24th. I mean, sorry, December 31st. So in December. There'll so be two. There'll be yeah. two in de December 31st. Okay. okay. So just. If there that's there will be other boards and commissions through the year, mostly towards uh, December, but yeah. uh, it will be in the Tree City Bulletin or, or contact Amy at any time. I mean, we would love to have you all on our boards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, Mr. Mayor, I was going to say as an aggregate, this group is no. by far some of the, most, the strongest yeah. candidates we have had. And I appreciate you guys being here and wanting to serve. Uh, it's amazing. Okay. Moving on. The solar eclipse, uh, Joan. <laughs> is it coming? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it already started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that Chris? Yeah. That's Chris. And just, I think you all know this, but Joan has been our fearless leader, uh, but she is not a, a one horse show here. There is a lot of folks side by side with her that aren't actually at the microphone, but. Um, there's been a group that she continues to herd us all together uh, routinely, both a small group of leadership folks like the police chief, fire chief, myself, and some others. Uh, and there's also a community, a larger community group, which includes, you know, downtown folks and the Kent State folks. So I, I will tell you this, and I, um, there's been, you know, obviously the county, Portage County Emergency Management Agency, they look at... Uh, training for this and preparing for this and, and every time there's been any kind of like uh, countywide exercise they always come back saying Kent is so far ahead of everybody and um, there are times that we're a bit exhausted by it I have to admit <laughs> I, if I hear the eclipse again after Monday that'll be too soon uh, I'm glad I won't be alive for the next one um, <laughs> but uh, try and, wait for and, and I will uh, you know, I think I wrote in the Tree City Bulletin, uh, part of our job is to prepare for kind of the worst. We're, we're, we're not natural pessimists, but we have to be planners, right? So we've been planning this thing uh, using, I don't want to say outrageous uh, uh, in, in terms of numbers of people coming, but we've taken the slightly more extreme uh, scenario so that we then could kind of work our way backwards and figure out, all right, you know, what traffic routing do we have to do? And can Jim mess with the signal timing to, you know, help? And uh, th there is literally probably, you know, 20, 30 different items like that that we've kind of tossed around. And, and today is really just kind of a wrap up. Uh, I, uh, she won't cover all those details. Um, it, it is amazing to sit in these things. If I didn't have to live through it um, and be responsible for part of it, it would be amazing. Uh, it's, it's probably a dissertation in and of itself. Um, um, so she won't cover all that tonight. She promised to keep it kind of concise, but please know that there is a whole lot behind this. So, Joan. Thank you so much, and thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for stretching. Trying to on. cover it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here tonight, especially during the middle of uh, National Public Health Week. And uh, I was going to say uh, thank you to all of the team members, especially um, you know those that you listed, Jim Bowen, Dave, Patty, and then all the partners that worked with us as well. And I think... Um, Although our city manager uh, would love to have an eclipse every single month to plan for, we are rapidly, <laughs> rapidly uh, closing in on probably the one that we'll, only one we'll see here in Kent during our lifetime. So as I was just doing some work, I just, uh, I, I love the idea that the Shocktow people uh, believed that an angry black squirrel was trying to eat the sun during an eclipse. And so they made a mm. lot of noise to drive that squirrel away. And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of fitting since I know the true city that also black squirrels a, a big deal here in Kent. So uh, we're, I think we're actually less than five days away now. And so just as a summary, uh, so that you're aware, the Portage County Emergency Operations Center is going to open on Friday. There'll be a call uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then they'll open physically uh, on Monday. Uh, and we'll have representatives there as well as on the calls. Uh, the Kent Multi-Agency uh, Command Team, or the <coughs> Management Team, opened back in September of 2023. Uh, we'll be meeting in person on Monday morning as well. The Kent Area Chamber of Commerce and Main Street Kent will have an operations post and we'll have communications with them. Um, I like to call that ground truthing so that we'll <laughs> have, we'll have that information of what's going on uh, if we're tied up in an office. 
Uh, Kenya Area Chamber of Commerce is also providing a tent uh, for, for not just information, but for minor first aid. Uh, the RN paramedic that works in my department will be there staffing it, as well as uh, um, another employee and some volunteers. And that'll be an easy conduit should something bigger than just a Band-Aid or a twisted ankle happen. Uh, she'll have a, a radio and she'll be in close contact with our EMS. Uh, the other thing, the other uh, purpose of that is a reunification center. So if people happen to get lost, if cell service is really not that great, uh, that's kind of your point of contact uh, in terms of um, wh where you might look for those who, aren't, who should be with your group but aren't currently. There'll also be a call center, uh, mostly housed at the Kent City Health Department, and that's to divert some of the calls away from the non-emergent <coughs> equips related calls and, and take the workload off of dispatchers. So um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention too is that the Ohio State Highway Patrol sent out, um, I want to say it was like a five page checklist covering everything that we should be thinking about as a community. They did this like three weeks ago and I thought, boy, if you haven't done this work yet, <laughs> you're not going to get it done in three weeks. But as we went through that checklist, we had already covered everything. We talked mm -hmm. about uh, or have some type of a plan um, in place for, for all of those um, type of things. Uh, and additionally, uh, I went ahead and trained two other staff members as well as 10 uh, Kent Parks and Recreation employees on Narcan and distributed those Narcan mm -hmm. kits to them just in case I gave a, an extra 50 Narcan kits to Kent City Police just to have on hand um, because it, it could be a possibility and I'd rather be, I'd rather be ready for it. We also um, created a frequently asked question list and we'll have that uh, distributed to those people taking the calls. In terms of messaging, that's kind of the task that's left now. Um, so Kent Area Chamber of Commerce and Main Street Kent, of course, have a great website, all kinds of social media posts, all their events and activities are listed there really want to focus on the safety and the viewing especially because just like the sun can burn your skin, the sun can burn your retina, but only you wouldn't feel pain. And instead of taking minutes to hours to get like a skin sunburn, you can damage your retina permanently in a matter of seconds and it's not painful at all. So we really want to make sure uh, that we're getting that message out on social media to wear um, you know, designated eye protection. So. That's important. And then again, in terms of group planning, especially if you have small children, uh, people with maybe cognitive disabilities, take a picture of them so that you know what they're wearing, you know what they look like. Uh, and that way then if they're separated from them, it's so much easier uh, to find them and you have all that information there. Make sure they have your contact information so in, in case they, uh, you know, cell phones don't work again, you have that other means of looking for people. Uh, let's see, Kent City Y website, uh, Patty's done a great job uh, linking to Kent Area Chamber of Commerce, Kent State, which is having a number of activities as well. And uh, again, uh, we look to Portage County AMA for their support. We had a nice group of articles in the Tree City Bulletin that I hope people took the time to read because I think it provided a lot of information. And then we really, I, I really appreciate all the cross-sharing of information from the Fire Department, Police Department, the City, and the Kent City Health Department. Uh, just making sure the more we see those messages and in different varieties, hopefully that will sink in. So, there's been a ton of planning, but not everything is under our control. So, uh, some outstanding concerns. Uh, how many will actually attend? What will the weather be like? You know, hopefully no mass casualty events. Um, and then the, the traffic after the event, that's going to be a, a major uh, concern, depending on how many people come in. Uh, any potential communication breakdowns, but again, we have layers of redundancy built into our plans for that. Uh, there is a concern for uh, food shortages and sanitation issues. I did uh, create a one-pager. I didn't tell our restaurants and grocery stores to stock up. I just said, here's some information for you. Look into it, and you make your best decisions on what you feel you need to do uh, in terms of the fact that there might be a lot of extra people in town. Uh, the fact that we have no uh, campgrounds, no designated campgrounds, so we just want to make sure that people are not um, camping when they should not be. And then, of course, the patients. You know, that's one thing I think we're going to really need, uh, mm -hmm. especially after the event, is people try to get back uh, to where they came from. So I also thought it was interesting that uh, the Diné people of the Northwest believe that an eclipse is a time of quiet reflection. 
So mm -hmm. we will be having a time of reflection as well after the event. <laughs> uh, we will be assessing our goal attainment and our opportunities for improvement. Uh, after an event, it becomes very clear which decisions were the best and which were maybe, you know, could have been done a little bit differently. But we want to carry those lessons and that learning forward with us as we plan uh, or look at other future situations. So truly, if after this event people say, this was no big deal, you did too much, I will know, and I think others will know too, we did just enough. So I want to thank you all for your support, and if you have any questions, keep your head over here. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions for Joan? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that your entire team did to try to make this. And I hope we do sit down and say, oh, you did too much. Because you know, all of this, right. all this planning and all of this hard work and just the cooperation and the relationships that you've built hopefully will, will nurture <coughs> our community for decades to come. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I think it will only benefit us for this. Jack? Joan, do we have any indication of, through hotel reservations or things such as that, what we might be experiencing? They're, they're, all, they're all booked solid. solid. And, okay. and like West Branch, they're completely booked, opened up 50 more primitive campsites. Um, mm -hmm. They have people coming in from South Carolina, Maryland, wow. Virginia. So people are mm -hmm. coming from out of town. Okay. So, yeah. And there's lots of events going on throughout the right. section. It's, you know, so there could be a lot of people. They're going to have, I think, nine food trucks down on Water Street from yes. what Michelle told me today. Yeah, so there'll be some Sunday, I think uh, four or five on Sunday, and then uh, eight or nine on, on Monday, you're right. Yeah. The only weird call I got is about your pets, and I told them, keep them inside and turn on some country western music for them. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, pets don't look at the sun, yeah. so right. it shouldn't be an issue. I, I realize that. You haven't met my dogs. <laughs> 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 Any other questions for Joan? If not, Joan, thanks for everything thanks you, get, right. your, no, no. you and your committee are doing. It's, yeah. it's overwhelming. Oh, Thank no, you. It was the yeah. team. It was not me. It was the all right. Next on the agenda is uh, City Hall project update, and Melanie is sick, and Dave is going to say she, it. So. She is. Um, the only thing we didn't do, Dom led Rotary in a sing along of Total Eclipse of the Heart. <laughs> so I was all set. We were practicing, but I guess we're not going to do it. Anyways, uh, <laughs> we've had a lot of fun. I mean, there is it's a lot of work, but it has been a lot of fun moments in this, too. So, yeah, unfort in a not-so-fun moment, there also seems to be viruses uh, in our offices. Um, Rhonda Hope, you see uh, Eric's here tonight for Hope. She's not well. Um, and Melanie has just had one thing after another. And... Um, yeah, when I lived, the five years I lived in the South, they would have said, bless her heart. I mean, she's just had one thing after another. Uh, but she still is on the job. She sent me a text this afternoon and said, here's what you should say for the City Hall update. Um, so let me make sure I read it right, get my readers on. Okay, the first floor drywall is complete. All glass is in on Haymaker Parkway side. Uh, the balance of the glass will be delivered today with installation of remaining three frames and glass to follow as weather lets us in the weeks to come. Should be about a five-day installation. Permanent power is on in the building. All brick is done on the haymaker side. They will be power washing and caulking to follow within the next two weeks. And work on the, in the public lobby area is starting tomorrow. So I hope you've had a chance to drive by it recently. Uh, something about seeing the windows actually in place gives it a much more finished look. Um, and we're starting to get some nice compliments. People are sort of anecdotally saying, what a great building. So uh, we're excited to get in it. Although I will tell you, in one of the meetings I was in with Melanie this week, <laughs> uh, now granted, she wasn't feeling well. So she's got the migraine. She's got her hand on her head. And I looked at her. I said, still on for July as an opening month? And she gave me the death stare. <laughs> so I don't know exactly how to interpret that. <laughs> if it was she was feeling ill or if she's worried about getting supplies delivered. I think she's, you've, you've heard her presentations over the last 12 months. She started ordering stuff 12 months ago knowing that the supply chain. Now it's gotten better than it was, you know, immediately post-COVID. But there are some things that we just can't get. So I don't know if that's part of the, part of the problem. But um, 
She's, she's earned her illness. I mean, she has worked tirelessly on this. I, I really want her to get well, though, and I told her stop working so hard. So she's not here tonight, but, and I hope she's not watching, and I hope she's not typing on her laptop. So if you are, Melanie, <laughs> go rest. So that's all she has. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's it for Community of the Whole. We're going to move into Community Development. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes, that's right. Uh, so we've got uh, one item here. It's our Climate Action Plan and Sustainability Update. Uh, Julie Morris, our Sustainability Coordinator, is going to be making that presentation. <laughs> With Bridget on the assist. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah. Hey, Bridget. <laughs> You do the Vanna White thing. <laughs> well, as she's doing that, I'll fill time again. Um, we're having Julie give this presentation, and um, some of you may have known her from her, her time on the Sustainability Commission as a volunteer, right. and she was such a good volunteer, we hired her. <laughs> um, so for those of you that are interested in, in getting on the commission, uh, you never know. It could be a future career opportunity for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Julie's been terrific. Um, this climate action plan stuff is not easy. I mean, it's not for the faint of heart. It's, uh, so it's a real credit to our community that we have one, but it's not enough just to have it, right? You've got to actually do it. And um, Julie's been instrumental. Uh, she's technically only part-time for us, um, but I've been working to try to see if we can get her, Bridget too, as, and Rhonda, we've talked about how can we get her full-time. So maybe you'll see her full-time at some point in the future. We hope so because... Given how much she does in half time, I can only imagine what we get out of her in double time, uh, or regular time, I guess I should say. So, um, yeah, I, I'll stop talking. They look like they're ready. So, Julie, it's all yours. All right. I'm going to kind of float here so I can man the slide as well. Oh, we need the microphone. Could you, yeah, carry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that she can record it. Yeah. Got your back, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> okay. How's that? Can you good, hear me better? Good. Okay. Good. All right, so good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to come and share about the Climate Action Plan, or as we like to call it, the CAP. Uh, it's now been a year since the city adopted the plan, and tonight we'll take a brief look at what we've been working on since adoption and where we're headed. Most of you are probably familiar with the CAP at this point, but for a quick refresher, uh, the Climate Action Plan as a whole is a five-year plan and is organized around these different focus areas. It features 15 different initiatives to help us meet goals and reduce emissions within these sectors. The collective purpose of the strategies is to build a foundation in Kent for continuous improvement in climate action. Much of our time since adoption of the plan has been spent obtaining our greenhouse gas inventory update, laying groundwork, building internal frameworks, exploring funding, and working on planning needing to strategically prioritize the CAP initiatives. So one of the first items that we wanted to tackle was undertaking an updated greenhouse gas inventory to give us a current picture of our emissions that would aid in our prioritization and development work. The city collaborated with Caramita to produce a basic level greenhouse gas inventory uh, using data from the calendar year 2022. <coughs> the update <coughs> confirms that commercial, institutional, and residential energy use continue to be our largest area of areas of emissions with a combined stationary energy total of 54.92% and transportation coming in right behind at 44.32% of our total 441,521 metric tons of CO2 equivalent that it's emitted within our city boundaries. So knowing that stationary energy and the transportation sectors house our greatest areas of emissions, we've prioritized work in these areas. This initiative work must be supported by ongoing funding and planning and is complemented by uh, providing necessary education and outreach work with the community as well. We'll dive into a little more detail about what specific work in these areas have been prioritized for 2024. So the city would like to lead by example and the first step in doing so is developing our municipal energy management plan or what's called, we call it a MEMP. A MEMP looks at things like energy savings performance, LED transitions for municipal lighting, energy efficiency revolving funds, energy efficiency procurement policies, and ways that we can <coughs> contribute to local grid resiliency. 
To aid in the development of the MEMP, the city has partnered with NOPEC and their contracted firm, World Connect, to help assist the city with a carbon energy audit for city buildings. Mm -hmm. Additionally, they will assist the city with prioritization of ongoing activities and a review of uh, mitigation strategies related to our municipal buildings, as well as help contextualize the work that we're doing uh, with the rest of the CAP. At this time, staff has provided World Connect with all of the information that they requested in order to begin that assessment, and uh, we're just currently pending receipt of that assessment. The city is also building on its existing work in these areas, taking advantage of opportunities to consider energy efficiency when new items are needed or repair or replacement of existing items become necessary. One recent example was the old gas-powered floor and ground sweeper uh, was replaced by the service department with an all-electric sweeper, which helps us reduce our emissions and contributes to healthy air quality within our facilities. The city also recognizes the importance of renewable energy in reducing emissions and has prioritized the CAP strategy of expanding solar energy as connected and complementary to our MEMP work. Um, as part of expanding solar energy and supporting local grid resiliency, World Connect will provide an assessment of up to two of the most feasible municipal facilities for on-site solar development. The city is also working to explore a community solar program that will enhance access to solar opportunities both in Kent and regionally within the next couple of years. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about our funding work. So there's a lot of exciting things happening uh, related to reducing our transportation emissions through development of our electric vehicle infrastructure and our bike and walk infrastructure. The CAP instructs us to explore Kent's current and future EV landscape, a priority for 2024. Happily, the East Main Street renovation project, among its many other benefits, uh, is planning to include approximately 32 dual port level two EV charging stations. The city is also planning to have two dual port level two EV charging stations installed at our new city hall. Uh, the CAP also instructs us to focus on the listed bike and walk infrastructure goals, all of which have current momentum, driven, which you've probably all heard lots about, driven by Jim and his wonderful team, um, that are all moving forward and are also a, pr a priority in 2024 and beyond. Another priority focus for 2024 is our education and outreach efforts that serve to help educate the Kent community about the CAP itself and the strategies that it suggests. As part of our CAP outreach, we've been busy developing important communication tools like our newly established sustainability overview webpage, a community email listserv to distribute information about our sustainability work, and literature about the CAP that can be disseminated at tabling and other events. With Karamita's help, we created the educational video about the CAP that you can find on our webpage. We have also participated in various conference presentations and interviews about the CAP over the course of 2023 and into 2024. We just held our CAP open house, introducing it to the public and the community with a total attendance of 51 folks, including staff, some staff. With Karamita's help, uh, we created the educational video about, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, some of our up-and-coming work around education and outreach. Um, let me back up. One step here. Continued community input around the CAP is actually very important, and helping advise us along the way is the City's Sustainability Commission. We meet monthly with me as a staff liaison to provide invaluable input around the City's CAP implementation work that's reflected of their professional, personal, and community knowledge. Some of our up-and-coming work around education and outreach in 2024 that will extend out into the larger community includes planning for and exploring CAP's suggested uh, City Business Climate Alliance and further development of academic partnerships with Kent State and the Kent City Schools around the CAP work that we're doing. We'll be working to focus on energy education, of which the CAP suggests 16 different ways to increase energy literacy within our community. We'll also be developing a city-issued e-newsletter to highlight and disseminate more detailed information about the city's cap work as we move forward. In addition, we're exploring the creation of an open house series whose sessions will allow us to dive more deeply into each one of the cap strategies and engage the community around them. So 
all of this work can't happen without thorough planning and it requires a variety of funding mechanisms. Planning is truly the crux of it all, allowing for us to be very clear about what we're trying to achieve with each of our CAP programs so that we can pair the appropriate funding to our efforts and so we can have the, the needed structures in place to hold and track data, develop metrics, and evaluate our progress. Each CAP initiative will ultimately have a work plan developed that considers these things, among others. So all that said, planning and funding will always be prioritized, and we have three areas of funding that we're currently utilizing to move the CAP work forward. Internal funding from city budget appropriations is one source. Budget appropriations were used to complete our greenhouse gas uh, inventory update, as an example, and we'll continue to assess budget appropriations as needed for the implementation work. We're also exploring the eventual development of an internal revolving loan fund that works to support the CAP initiatives as well. Grants and external funding opportunities are a large component of how this work will get uh, done. Mm -hmm. We should, um, well, it should be noted that much of the inflation reduction funding, the federal funding, uh, that's available for municipal programs is made first available to state governments who then provide pass-through programs and funding opportunities that cities can apply for. The city has provided letters of support for several IRA grant opportunities, two of which would support funding structures for CAP work and development of our community uh, solar programs. The Ohio Air Quality Development Authority, or the OAQDA, um, and the Ohio EPA led the state in applying for the National Clean Investment Fund and the Solar for All IRA funding opportunities. The National Clean Investment Fund could help support Kent's work around development of new financial tools uh, to help fund CAP programs like the development of a revolving fund. The Solar for All funding could help support the development of Kent's community solar program. Um, and ultimately, the state would be creating guidelines for how these programs uh, would be administered, and most will require collaboration with state and regional entities to be successful. OAQDA expects to hear in the spring, uh, hopefully very soon, as to whether uh, they will receive funding from these IRA competitions. And our having pro uh, provided letters of support for their applications essentially connects us to those pass-through grant opportunities. Um, in-kind services are another very important part of getting our CAP work implemented. We've described some of the services that NOPEC is providing the city that will help us develop our MEMP and help the city expand solar energy over the next year or so. An additional component of their services is to provide a funding roadmap for the initiatives that, they that they're going to suggest, providing a clear path to funding that will help us accomplish that work. Part of their services also includes membership in a regional cohort of five NOPEC communities to collaborate with, which helps provide demonstrable partnerships necessary for many funding opportunities. Their in-kind services are valued at over $40,000. The city is also currently participating in the Northeast Ohio Resilient and Cities and Counties Leadership and Learning Cohort. It's a mouthful. Uh, that has been convened by ICLE, the Local Governments for Sustainability USA. This year-long in-kind service will also provide regional collaboration opportunities as a first-of-its-kind leadership initiative convening up to 20 area communities to leverage a holistic sustainability framework for government processes. Additionally, it provides the opportunity for the city to further our prioritization work and assist with our funding and cost analyses for the CAP initiatives. So, now that we've looked at what has been prioritized for 2024, we'll take a very brief look at where we go for the remaining years of the plan. 2025 will see us utilize the completed MEMP to develop and implement initiatives that were suggested out of that plan. 2025 will see the continued development of the community solar program, and of course there'll be ongoing education and outreach efforts um, around that work. We'll also continue to lay groundwork for programs that will be started in 2026. Um, we'll continue to work with experts, consultants, the Sustainability Commission, and community and regional stakeholders for ongoing input and evaluation while moving through our implementation process, also sharing our successes and best practices along the way. 2026 to 2028, we'll see a focus on um, the following CAP outlined initiatives, the Residential Subsidized Energy Audit Program, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Ordinance, and Green Leasing Initiatives. 
will continue to support and implement, and implement transportation efforts, of course, and turn attention to the CAP waste and urban tree credit initiatives. Those are, again, all strategies that are outlined in the CAP as well. Additionally, we'll conduct another greenhouse gas inventory update to check our progress and help strategically develop what our next planning process goals and reduction targets will be. Beginning in 2029, we'll undergo another climate action planning process, and we'll do so every five years after that, uh, reflective of our emission reductions and achievements and our new goals until carbon neutrality is achieved by 2050, or hopefully sooner. Mm -hmm. So I know that that is a whole lot of information, <laughs> kind of dry, kind of all smashed together in a real quick thing. So thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. So uh, this is uh, a report, so we don't need any kind of a motion or anything. Are there any questions? Very thorough. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a question? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Is there anyone from the audience that has a question? Yeah. No? All right. Very good. Nice Thanks, job. Julie. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. Keep going. Very good. All right. That's moving great. on to finance. <coughs> Mr. <coughs> DeLeon. Okay. <laughs> I was talking. <laughs> Donations to the Parks and Recreation. Mm. Uh, football and cheer equipment. Angela, hello. Right, hello. I'm going to bring this back to speaking about Parks and Rec. This <coughs> seems to be a very inspiring night, and we are now moving forward to be referred to as the most fun. I'll take that as a win. Um, coming before you tonight um, in an effort to support the newly established Kent Youth Football and Cheer Organization, um, we are requesting that you waive the requirement to go out for competitive bid. We have football equipment and uniforms and cheer uniforms um, that we would like to donate. The board has unanimously voted to donate these items to that organization to help transition them into branching out and being their own independent nonprofit in the community. And we would like to support that. Questions? Are there any, uh, thank you, are there any legal ramifications that we should be concerned about in this donation? Good question. I would have asked Hope that question, but maybe you're not prepared for it. I wasn't prepared for it, but no, I said because the amount is de minimis, uh, for it's well below our threshold, so no, I do not see any legal issues with it. Okay. And, and I can tell you Hope had, I've had that conversation with okay. Hope, and I, there's probably even a memo from Hope or email that says, Nope, it's totally fine. You have, as a charter community, you have the ability, the council has the ability to waive competitive bidding in appropriate cases, and she felt like this completely met that criteria. Well, I just want to, I just want to encourage, you know, that I'm encouraged that this is a really positive step. Um, hopefully it will support the activities and the programming for this new youth uh, group, and, um, and so I appreciate the fact that the board was willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I just, I know I'm familiar from being uh, as a liaison on there um, with this process kind of going forward and I was there when the board voted unanimously in favor of it. I'm also aware that some of the organizers have gone through some additional steps in order to kind of like tighten up their organization. Um, do, if you could maybe speak to that a little bit and also a little bit about the community that this serves directly. These. There are, I know that there's a tremendous number of kids that participate in this program and it's very special to them and that community. If you could just speak to that for the rest of council, please. Yeah, and I, I think going back even a little bit further, I mean, this has been a group um, in the community for many, many years and I don't know the amount of years, but I would guess 25, 30, maybe mm -hmm. plus years. Um, they've, they've been on their own for a very long time. Um, there were some discussions at some point pre-COVID um, to have them come under Parks and Rec. And we did, it was delayed a few years because of COVID, and we did run that together um, as a partnership for three seasons. Um, at the end of last season, we mutually agreed they want to grow, they have dreams that they want to reach very much quicker than they can being under a government department because <laughs> we have so many boundaries and restrictions and they can't do fundraising. Um, so they have gone and um, registered themselves as an official nonprofit, <coughs> and they have established their own board of 10 members. Mm -hmm. So they have delegated the duties that we had one sports 
activity coordinator doing out of our office among 10 people on a board um, on their end, which I think is a very, very wise move. Um, I think that's going to serve them well. Um, they do serve about 150 up to 160 um, kids. And these are, you know, young, young boys playing football and a lot of young girls who are very, very interested in, in cheer. So it's a, it's a tradition. You know, they, they have a, I mean, Kent, I mean, not just Kent, but especially in Kent, you know, there's a football culture and they want to start them young. So um, they've got, you know, the schools involved and, and members on the, the coaching staff at the high school who are involved with this board as well. So I think this is, this is probably a, the most positive move that this program could make. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions, Chris? Thank you. Um, can you say anything about the sourcing of the, um, the, the the equipment? The sourcing of the the equipment, where it's coming from. We already own it. Okay. Yeah. It's it's owned, owned by and Parks and Rec. Owned and purchased. Okay. Correct. Yeah, okay. and a lot of it I will say is branded specifically to Kent. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is red and black. The helmets are custom. Um, there's a lot of logos on things and embroidery on cheer uniforms, so they're not of much interest to anyone outside of Kent. You mean Ravenna wouldn't want them? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just a follow-up question. This is probably just oh, due diligence. Is I'm aware that when we accept this donation, instead of going competitive, um, you know, I know that football helmets wear over time. I know that we are concerned about the safety of our of the, the the boys playing football, so just checking that that's covered from your end in terms of the helmets and other things being of highest kind of quality. Yeah. So the the most important as far as a timeline with an expiration would be the helmets, mm -hmm. um, but they are required to be <coughs> certified every two years. So we bought helmets two years ago, um, <coughs> three years ago. We had them recertified last year. They're not due to be recertified till 2025, and then we bought brand new helmets last year. That do not need to be recertified till 2025. Cool. So Thank they're you. all on the same schedule. Thanks. Further? Yes. Council? Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, Angela, would you agree that um, really this is serving a large number of kids and that staffing at the Parks and Rec just can't sustain programs this large? Would that be an accurate statement? Um, we have, most of our sports programs are much larger. Okay. I mean soccer, you know, one, yeah. one season's 450 kids. Mm -hmm. So our basketball program is just as large. Um, I would say that the time and dedication to this one program is, is much more consuming. Um, the people who I think are going to excel and do so good on this, you know, do such a nice job on this board, um, you know, they, they have so many ideas and they have so many things that they want to do that come up throughout the season that sometimes it's hard to keep up with that. Right. Um, but I think with them spreading that among 10 board members, they're, they're going to be much more successful. So would you say that their 10 board members are going to act almost like um, we would expect our staff to provide those services if, they, if you had 10 mm -hmm. additional staff members, let's put it that way. Correct. That would do. Okay. Further, Robin. Yeah, the <clears throat> one of the major <coughs> issues that uh, I know uh, the gentleman that actually stepped up and took that program because it, it with everything that's going on uh, in the football domain that's come out in the pros and college and high school and so forth. A lot of parents, Kent used to be, uh, as you had indicated, a football crazy town. And it's been on the decline, at least for the younger uh, people. I came up through this program when it was Ken Hornets and back in the 60s. And uh, with uh, the decline and everything, we used to have as many as 200 and some kids coming out. There had been a decline, but it started to come back under Marcus Wright and some of the other parents and people who have stepped up uh, to uh, create opportunities for a lot of these kids who uh, otherwise who were not soccer players. 
and I think it's very important. I think I really appreciate you stepping up, understanding where they're trying to move to so they can become a, uh, uh, at the end of the day, they become a much more vital uh, institution in the community, uh, in the community again. So I uh, definitely support what you're doing. It was, uh, I think, a, a terrific thing that you would turn over and allow them to be able to move on so that they can uh, be more competitive with surrounding communities and get big Kent back to where it was. They, like I said, they've got a lot of headwinds based on what's going on. But I think that uh, if in fact they're given that opportunity, they're going to be able to do a lot of really positive things. So I commend you on stepping up and uh, doing that for them. Further questions? Yeah, I have. Yeah, so <laughs> this might deviate a little bit away from this donation, but I just I'm curious, you know, since since this program is kind of exiting from Kent Parks and Rec, is this a budget saver? Yes and no, um, because we did incur uh, eight percent increases this year, so our budget kind of reabsorbed a lot of that in personnel costs. But if they hadn't formed their own organization, then mm -hmm. there would be. Yeah, but a lot of the revenue we do we do collect for this program is based on program registration fees um, that come out of the um, you know parents' pockets for their child to play, and then we do you know we get support with sponsors as well for the program. So we just will not be receiving those. Um, registration fees and we won't be receiving those those donations or sponsorships that would go back into that program. Further questions? Anyone from the audience have a question or comment? Back council. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, allow for the donation of Kent Parks and Rec uh, youth football and cheer equipment. I With the emergency. That. With an emergency. I second that. Seconded. Okay. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes. Thanks, Angela. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. Angela. <coughs> Celebrate Kent. Who's up next? Bridget, probably. <laughs> Bridget's back. All right. Bridget's back. It's strange to be speaking over these next two committees, though, because usually I'm yeah. in CD. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I know. Well, this is just an informational piece. Um, Dave and I felt it was a good opportunity to introduce some of the new council members to two programs that the city runs, um, <coughs> that grant programs the city runs that we use general fund dollars to support. Community development does many grant programs, most of which are tied to state and federal funding sources, so those have some limitations and requirements on them. So these are two small programs that I'm going to talk about. Um, that without having those state and federal requirements, we're allowed to uh, help uh, agencies that wouldn't qualify under some of those other sources. The first one is the Celebrate Kent program, and I'm going to credit Dan Smith for this, our former Economic <laughs> Development Director. It was kind of a brainchild of his. We have fine-tuned it over the years, um, but the goal was to get um, events downtown, to bring people to the town and support agencies and organizations that did that. Um, it's usually we allocate um, about 15000 for it, so it's not a big program. We, we supplement. We don't actually fund a lot. It does re have a match requirement. It's a dollar-for-dollar dollar match, or if it's in-kind supported, it has to be equal to $2 uh, in-kind to $1 in grant donation. Uh, we had 13 proposals submitted uh, this year from seven different um, organizations. And um, I believe there was a spreadsheet of those uh, different activities in, in your uh, packet. Um, many of these events you're familiar with, and they are excellent uh, uh, for the community because they bring so many people into the town. Um, there were two that were not funded, and these were only because they, were, they did not fall within the confines of the requirements of the grant. The one actually would have is a public art um, initiative that is not something that would have been an event and met, met that criteria. Um, and another one was for a material um, 
for a diversity program. Uh, must have been three years ago now. There was a small carve out um, to allocate funding to events or activities to promote diversity. Uh, some years we've had people apply, some we have not. This year we did have um, applicants. Uh, we've had the South and Juneteenth, I believe we funded that. Now this will be our third year. And then the NAACP submitted um, two different projects, one of which we could fund. It was a breakfast, because uh, it does have to be an event. Um, then they also had submitted for coloring books, which would have been a material purchase. So that one wasn't funded, but we were able to fund their others. Um, this program has been um, basically very popular. I will at this moment say though that Dave and I are looking at potentially maybe changing this or looking at different ways of uh, maybe coming back with some other kind of grant program in the economic development realm. We've been hearing from some of our small businesses in months such as January and February um, that sometimes cash flow is tight. Uh, during COVID, we were uh, fortunate enough to get CDBG money and we were able to give small grants to um, 14 different businesses uh, and all 13 out of those 14 were able to retain a low income job. That's all we were asking is please keep your door open and retain one job. So a little bit goes a long way. So uh, we don't have any of the framework of that shaped out, but I do think that we could come up with some reasonable uh, grant program that might be more of a direct assistance. This is great because it provides ancillary support by bringing people into the town. Uh, so maybe we'll be doing a blend of two different types of programs. So I just want to put that out there. The other oh, grant. Bridget. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't see the spreadsheet. Does anybody? Uh, I can give you one. Should be in the. It wasn't in the packet. It's in the packet. It's just the next section. Yes, yeah, so the, the next. It's, it's right here. Next right? to the other. Yeah, those are the social services. Social you didn't services. Have, did the it's packet in there. not take include the? It's in the water. I didn't Here, see it. Here it is. You can have that one. Okay. I, I'll make sure it gets emailed. Oh, okay. Thank you. It was, it was with Eric's memo. It wasn't. It's maybe yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. It didn't. No. Okay. I'm I'm online, but we can set that up. <coughs> It's on your mm -hmm. It's in here? Yeah. Uh, hmm. The second program is the social service funding program. We basically allocate $65,000 a year for this program. This year uh, we did uh, seven different nonprofits received assistance. These programs um, are <coughs> typically not ones that we can always assist through our CDBG grant. So um, it provides a little bit of assistance with less of the limits of it being only for low to moderate income people. Uh, the recipients this year were uh, Coleman Health Services. We've run this program now for several years. It's an eviction prevention uh, program. A lot of the severe and persistent mental illness clients of Coleman are often uh, basically house insecure. So this is sometimes that money that's needed to make sure that they can stay in housing. We've also supported community legal aid for, for years. I don't think I've been ever more impressed with a small agency that does so much. I refer many, many uh, residents to community legal aid and these are volunteer attorneys that commit their time and talents um, to programs. We, we support our fair housing agency which has legal services in the realm of fair housing. But we run into everything where, for example, somebody desperately needs to qualify for our rehab program because they have a leaking roof or a, a furnace issue. They've been separated from a spouse for years, but they can't meet the requirements because they're both still considered in that house. We help them get the assistance to get a divorce, to get a separation, uh, quick claim deeds, things that seem overwhelming to um, certain members of our community are easily addressed and answered to community legal aid. So I feel like this is, this is one of my favorite programs, I will tell you. Uh, I, they just do so much for the little bit we give them. Uh, the next project is Access Point Community Health Centers, also formerly known as Family and Community Services. So they have merged with Access Point and this is the new name. They've run a program called Housing and Emergency Support Services, which we call HES. It's similar to the one we do with Coleman, it basically provides um, emergency assistance to, for eviction and utility shutoff prevention. Uh, family and community services provides uh, uh, many varieties of housing, everything from permanent supportive to transient housing to emergency shelter. This is geared towards those that are in the per per uh, permanent supportive housing. Um, many of them have vouchers through PMHA, but they are responsible for a small percentage and this helps offset that. 
Uh, the other program that we funded for Access Point Community Health Centers is uh, Portage Area Recovery Center. Uh, we basically provide services to an agency for women that are in recovery. So we actually provided a much larger grant to get this facility up and running uh, about five years ago, and it has been successful. There has been some recidivism. I will not say that it's worked in all situations, but that program has been fairly successful and then combined uh, with um, PARC, we have been able to <coughs> keep people that are seeking recovery in their house. Uh, the next program that we support is also through Access Point Community Health Centers. This is the domestic violence shelter. Um, so Safer Futures is a small unit, but they, it, they do a lot. So um, this again is also a program where I've seen a lot done with very little money. So this program we could fund with CDBG, but we also provide money to Family Community Services for Miller House, for emergency shelter. And we are capped at how many service projects we can do through CDBG. So the way that we can give them assistance for the domestic violence shelter is through this program. We also uh, support Love Light. Uh, so those of you that know Betsy Justice is uh, committed, committed to her youth programs and uh, she is always working so hard to make sure that she's getting um, the, these kids what they need um, in terms of care and she adjusts when she finds that, uh, you know, they're, they're not engaged. So um, she is very precise with her budget too. We gave everybody this year exactly what they asked for. So we gave her all the way down to her 46 cents at the end there. <laughs> I just I, I'm like, you can really round up, it's okay. <laughs> um, and the last project is Portage Metropolitan Housing Authority. It's a good neighbor program. Uh, sometimes there's disconnect in, in, in um, housing authority projects and voucher assisted programs. So this works to coordinate efforts through basically outreach and community initiatives at the actual public housing as well as uh, units or um, uh, facilities that take vouchers. This also has been a great program that we have supported for many years. Um, very little money goes a long way. They've got a, a great project manager on this. Um, so these are basically ones that aren't voted on by council where the, the council appropriates the money and then staff just awards based on uh, what the applications are. We tend to always receive the same. These programs have been in place for a while. We did receive two this year um, that were not within the confines of the regulations. One actually was at, at UH, the Robinson Hospital. It was a good concept. Um, basically a food pantry for those in need in the lobby, but it wasn't in here in Kent, it has to be in Kent. Mm -hmm. And they said that they could make sure it was just addressed for um, those with the zip code 44240, but I explained that covers the township. <laughs> so unfortunately, it, yeah. they, if they could come up with a satellite one here, yeah. submit again next year. And then Town Hall 2 submitted one um, that was honestly the funding was asked was more than what we had to give to all the agencies. So I had to kind of be like, oh, sorry, that's and, and the project was a concept. It wasn't actually up and running. We want this money to be used. We don't want, I mean, not that we're, we don't support new programming, but this is a little bit of money. We just want to make sure we're getting it into direct delivery of services. So um, he's, he understands uh, what types of projects and he'll probably be submitting next year. Questions? Mike? Raj? Yeah. Uh, Bridget, I, I just wanted to make sure that, that everyone understands. These dollars aren't dollars that we get from state or federal funding. These are actual tax dollars from the city of Kent. And that is correct. And our um, other communities, uh, as forward thinking as we are in terms of providing their. Uh, I can't really answer that. You I don't can know. tell you yeah. I used to work at Summit County, so I worked with multiple counties and. Um, some had varying needs, but most typically use CDBG dollars to fund these types of projects. Right. I will say it was unique for me when I came here 16 years ago to see a allocation and appropriation from local assistance and that it's been maintained. And really, we, even during COVID, we had to reduce, but we were able to still continue right. giving a little bit of help. So, so that speaks volumes of our community. Agreed. Yeah. Yes. Further questions? Heidi? I believe, and maybe you can answer this, Mike, that... Wasn't this a, an initiative of Bill Schultz? Somewhat. I think he was yeah. he spearheaded it. He was one of, yeah. He I think it was. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Further questions? Mm -hmm. Further, anybody from the audience? Have it. Back to council. 
moved on. Well, we don't need anything. It's uh, just, yeah, it's just a report. report. Yeah. Yeah, we don't need to do anything. Cool. Okay, thanks, Bridget. I'm going to stay here. <laughs> oh, you're going to stay here for the oh, day. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I mean. I'm in two committees. That's in a different committee. Yeah, this is. This is. <laughs> I'm done. All right, streets and side door utility, Mr. Sidoti. Uh, making her debut on this committee. <laughs> it's Bridget <laughs> Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> so, really, I can't you're remember right. ever. I, I don't think I can either. Anyway, we, we're going to be talking about the Earth Day vendor market. Yes. So Brandon and Kent uh, uh, has identified an event where they are going to have a vendor market on Earth Day on April 20th. Uh, the interest in the, in, the, uh, in the event was so great that the vendors will not all fit into Dan Smith Park. So she, that's where it had, was going to be organized. So she has submitted an event permit to have some of the vendors out on Erie Street. Basically, um, it'll close from East Erie Street between South Water and then the private alley that's used uh, as a uh, uh, drive through for Tree City Coffee. Uh, and the vendors will be out there. It's going to run just that single day from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. And uh, she's here basically asking for the permit to be approved with emergency. Any questions from council members? Seeing none, anyone in the audience? Oh, do I miss one? Who did I miss? Is it, is it? Oh, there you are. Is this, is this the same day as Who's Your Mama? Uh, no, I don't mm -hmm. believe so. Uh, who's Your Mama? Well, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe. No, no, no. I don't no, think no. it is, though. No, I think Who's Your Mama was in February. That's later in the year in October. So oh, it's October? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's okay. always around Earth Day. Who's you know, know what? It's yeah. on the Celebrate Kent. So I don't know if the date's on there, but we fund that event, Who's Your Mama, through Celebrate Kent. Right. I just thought that was kind of kind of cool to have, maybe possibly, two festivals <laughs> at the same time. Any other questions? No. no? I, th I think it's Anyone great. Anyone else before I go? No. Nope. Anyone? Uh, any audience? Yeah. No. Seeing none. Back to council. It is. Same day. I'll move to approve with the emergency. I'll Second. Any any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. There you go, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we're going to move into executive session. I need a motion. Yeah, I'll move an executive session to discuss board and commission appointments. Second. Is there a second? Second. Second by Chris. Any discussion? Roll Seeing call. none, all in favor signify roll call. Mr. Amrine? Yes. Ms. Selko? Yes. Mr. Clapper? Yes. Mr. DeLeon? Yes. Mr. Hook? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Ms. Schaefer Bish? Yes. Mr. Sidoti? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. I ask everybody to leave the room and we'll recap.